When we're consulting with a patient regarding extraction of a maxillary molar tooth, one of the things we always cover in the informed consent process is the possibility of an opening from the extraction socket into the maxillary sinus as a result of the extraction. In other cases, the pathological process itself that's necessitating removal of the tooth results in a communication because of this process between the socket and the sinus. Uh, when this is the case, we want to evaluate for this preoperatively and plan for it in our procedure so that closure of the oral antral communication is part of the initial and intended procedure. So this case involves an 82-year-old female that was referred to me by her general dentist uh, for the procedure that you'll see in a moment. She has a history of hypertension and also of uh, non-insulin dependent adult onset diabetes. You can see here on the referral slip that it's asking me to evaluate an area of an open flap that's buckle to tooth number three. The patient had had prior root canal therapy uh, because of an endodontic lesion two years ago, but the lesion has failed to heal and this uh, apparent open flap has developed. So the dentist would like me to please evaluate and advise on the necessary treatment, if any. So let's take a look at this clinically, and what we see is uh, tooth number three does have a uh, PFM crown on it, and there is something that appears to be some type of flap in the buccal vestibule or along the buccal alveolus. So our radiograph of choice in this case is going to be a cone beam CT, and so here you see the Galileo's panoramic projection of this patient's uh, jaws, and you'll notice right away that there's some type of radiolucent lesion at the apex of tooth number three. So we'll take a better look at this area with some other slices. And what we notice is there is a rather large area of radiolucency at the apex, actually, of the palatal root of tooth number three. And you can see that this radiolucent area actually perforates into the maxillary sinus. You can see this is a fairly extensive lesion that uh, not only does it perforate into the sinus, but you also have reactive thickening of the sinus uh, membrane and fluid in the sinus adjacent to it. So you can well imagine that there's going to be lots of granulation tissue in the apical region of this tooth. And once you curette that out, you're going to have a fairly large opening into the maxillary sinus. One thing that many years of clinical surgical experience teaches you is that when you go in to deal with one of these lesions, they are always much larger clinically than they appear radiographically. There are a variety of different techniques that you can use in order to close this site. And uh, in this case, one of the considerations we have to make is whether or not the patient plans to have a dental implant placed in this site uh, sometime in the future. In the days before dental implants became the standard of care for replacing missing teeth, uh, and the patient would have had a bridge or a partial denture over this area, we were more concerned with just closing the site over than with preserving bone so that um, an implant could be placed down the line. But now that we have implants that are so successful, uh, one of our concerns is going to be uh, that we reconstruct this area so that the patient can have a dental implant placed once the site has healed. We're going to start our procedure by giving some infiltration with a local anesthetic, and my preferred local to use is 4% articane for these uses. It penetrates very well and has uh, gives good profound local anesthesia. So I'm going to infiltrate it around the tuberosity area on the buccal and on the palatal so uh, we have good local anesthetic. We're going to carry that to about the second premolar region. So uh, you can see here that little exposed root or bone underneath that flap of tissue. There's a lot of uh, inflamed, or what we call friable tissue, that's obviously going to need to be removed. So we're going to start by making a sulcular incision uh, between the first and second premolars. That's why we, why we had to give local at, that far anteriorly, and then carry it into the sulcus distally, and then uh, carry our incision around tooth number three, which you're going to be extracting, and then into the maxillary tuberosity region because we're going to be uh, elevating our flap and reflecting it back that far. Preparing the patient for surgery is just as important as the actual procedure itself. And so I like to use a regimen of a little bit of antibiotic coverage because we, A, are going into an infected area in this case, and B, we're placing an implant. Not a dental implant, but an implant of bone and a uh, barrier membrane. So I start them on a regimen of chlorhexidine oral rinse, uh, the standard 0.12% uh, concentration, twice a day. And I like to use amoxicillin, uh, 
875 milligrams twice a day as opposed to the uh, 500 milligrams three times a day. And I have the patient start this two days before the procedure and take them until they're both gone. So there's two prescriptions, both used two times per day, and both started two days before. So the patient just has to remember the number two. So that means a 16 ounce bottle will last 16 days. And if they start two days before, then it will go uh, for 14 days starting with the day of surgery. And then the amoxicillin will go for a total of six days. If the patient's allergic to amoxicillin, we can substitute either biaxin or ciprofloxacin. And I like them because they're both BID dosing also. The reason I like it is it's much easier for the patient to remember to do something two times a day than to do it three or four times a day.